Hello everyone and welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and today we are going to be talking about Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah Winfrey, which aired this Sunday last year. So it's been uh, quite a turbulent ride for them since this interview aired. Literally Prince Philip, Harry's grandfather, died a month almost to the day that the interview went to air. And so it did, at the time, they shared about their plight within the royal family. They shared some of the struggles that they allegedly had. And as a result, they got a bit of a bump in the public. People really empathized with them. But in this year since, people have started to question more and more. And you have to ask yourself, was this right decision for Harry and Meghan to make to have this interview and share all their grievances about the royal family? And looking back, I'm gonna argue that the answer is no. And here are the reasons why. So the first thing is authenticity. So now if you look at Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah, specifically Megan. Number one thing is Megan is very much trying to emulate Diana in her look. So if you look at her eye makeup, it's very, her eyes are very outlined, very dark eyeshadow, and all this sort of thing that usually she does not do. And it very much mimics Princess Diana's look when she was on Panorama. And in addition to that, she's trying to extend Princess Diana's naive victim narrative into herself as well, but it doesn't really work. So kind of what Megan said is that absolutely nobody helped her within the royal institution. Now we know pretty much that this is not true because we've seen very successful royals that cat like Catherine, Camilla, and Sophie marry into the royal family and be incredibly successful. And this happened in part because Diana had such a terrible time. Because at the end of the day, the institution, the monarchy, wants to survive. So this idea that Harry and Meghan, and Meghan specifically, had absolutely no help is just a little ridiculous. She had Samantha Cohen, Samantha the Panther, who's been with the royal family, I think for like 15, 18 years when she started working with Harry and Meghan. And so you can't tell me that she wasn't helpful. And then Megan kind of also kind of made the illusion that she, well, she didn't know the, the national anthem. And I'm sure they told her what it was, kind of explained it and said, well, you're a 37 year old woman. I'm sure you can figure this out. And so it wouldn't take much to Google it and to memorize it. And obviously as a former actress, they would anticipate that Megan could actually memorize a national anthem that says God save the queen for about three stanzas of the whole thing, very short. The melody is the same as one of our patriotic songs here in the United States. I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> and so she tries to portray herself in, as Diana, continuing this naive victim narrative, but it doesn't work because Megan was in her late thirties when she married into the Royal Institution. She was a professional, she was an actress, she had her own blog. She was very much aggressive and ambitious in trying to achieve her goals. So how in the world would this ambitious woman not be able to merge within the royal family, especially one that wants to utilize her skills in that way. Now, there is a royal family where that is not the case and that is Japan. Japan is very much very, very, very rigid, horrid to women. Megan was not in that situation. There was not a system to break her down. They were trying to get her to mold within what they had. Yes, things can change as you go on, but everybody knows who is a professional is that you don't come into your job telling everybody that you're going to change everything because you know better your first day. And allegedly, according to Lady Colin Campbell's book, that's kind of what Megan did. All right, and so another thing to consider about Megan is that she kind of joked with Oprah Winfrey that she didn't expect anything she was saying to be shocking. And how could it not though? Because you're an intelligent person. If you go to the media and tell them things you know they don't know, and things that are inflammatory, like somebody made a comment about your son's potential skin tone, that um, they ignored you when you were having mental health issues, you anticipate that is shocking, but Megan kind of laughs it off going, well, I'm just telling my story. But that's not really the case because anyone can tell that anyone who's a professional, who's a business person knows that that is shocking. And so again, it comes across as inauthentic for her to say, well, you know, I'm just telling my story. I didn't expect anyone to think that it was, you know, shocking or concerning or anything. I'm just telling you what happened. I mean, it just comes across as incredibly inauthentic. Okay, and one of the last things I will say is, now again, this is all kind of my opinion, 
But throughout her interview, Megan very much, she was an actress on it. She took long, breathy pauses. You know, she, she, she was silent. She's like, well, I have to think. And it came across as kind of, again, inauthentic, as if she was putting on a bit of an extra dramatic flair because she couldn't really help herself. Um, Lady Colin Campbell kind of says the same thing in her book is that sometimes in her roles, Megan would overdo it because she was so kind of excited about getting a part. And if you watch Harry in the interview, his demeanor, the way he talks, is very, very much different than Megan's. And so he comes across as very authentic. And she, when you look at it, does it? And you know, really that authenticity has kind of traveled with them since that interview. Of course, you know, they did this because they wanted to get their story out there, but we found out later that they knew Prince Philip was on his deathbed when they did this. Was this score settling? I mean, why did they have to do it at that time? It probably would have been better to wait because then people wonder, well, did you push your grandfather into his grave? Um, I don't think they did. Um, you know, he was 99 years old at the time, but people were wondering, hey, why did you do this when you knew your grandmother was stressed with losing her husband, your grandfather was not doing well, why do this interview? What, what did it gain you at that time? And then you kind of look at the projects they've done since then. Megan's 40 by 40, we literally know nothing about how that went. Did anybody talk to anyone? There's a couple of statements on their website, Archwell, but like there's no reports, no impact. And so did anybody do it? Did anybody really participate? Like what was the point of it except to do a video, video with Melissa McCartney and have um, Harry juggling in the background? Like so. Um, and then most recently, probably the biggest thing that's gotten them called out again is the NAACP Image Award. They were, got, they were given this in part as you know, civil rights leaders or something. And even people within that community that might be kind of supporters of Harry and Meghan going, pump the brakes here. There are many, many more people who are much more deserving of this award, who do not get recognition, who do this out of the goodness of their hearts. And it screams as a PR move and that the, the award was purchased for them as a relationship between the NAACP, Harry and Meghan, and their shared PR company, Sunshine Sachs. That's the allegation. It kind of makes sense. And a lot of people identified with that because they were like, hey, this just doesn't seem right that these people who've done nothing except for spout word salad from their mansion in Montecito are somehow getting this award that other people are far more deserving of. And kind of the biggest thing in all this is that what strikes people is that they called out the institution, said that one of the family members um, made comments about Archie's potential skin tone, that they ignored her, Megan's mental health plights, that they did not help them, that they were terrible, horrible, dismissive, all these sorts of things. And yet they still continue to use the royal titles the institution gave them. And they use them all the time. Megan introdu introduced herself to a group of children through her kind of story time reading thing, she said, hi, I'm Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. And Catherine went, hi, I'm Catherine. Because she knew that the royal title, because Catherine did her own story time thing and she didn't feel the need to push her royal title. And so the Harry and Meghan continue to use this royal title. I mean, they are allowed to use it, but it strikes as inauthentic because they're calling this institution terrible, yet they're perfectly fine using the influence that those titles give them to curry favor, to curry money, to curry deals, all these sorts of things. So it strikes people as terribly inauthentic. And as the interview goes on, um, and as time goes on, that becomes more and more evident. So second thing is entitlement. Harry and Meghan, especially Harry, came across as incredibly entitled, especially considering where the, we are in the world right now. Their statements about not getting security and having to live off, live off Diana's you know, money, you know, that $25 million, that just doesn't go very far. It just comes across as incredibly entitled. And just as the situation deteriorated in Afghanistan and we have now the war going on in Ukraine, People are like, well, so? <laughs> you know, they did have to pull his security and he's still fighting about this because he wanted the taxpayers to fund 
his security. And it costs a lot of money for them to do that in Canada. I'll put the exact amount uh, at the bottom, but people were very upset about this because it's like, well, you're traipsing around on a six week vacation and you're costing the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars for this. And can you imagine doing that for a year in California? It would have cost millions. They would have had to relocate the protection officer's family members. And also Harry could produce a reality TV show with Netflix. No, that's not how it works. Because when you leave a job, you know, adults know this and grownups know this, you leave the perks of it. And having security funded by the taxpayer was a perk that Harry enjoyed. But once he left the job, he no longer had the joy of security. And that's perfectly, that he should have expected that, that that was something that he harped on was just a little bit ridiculous because you know he's perfectly capable of funding it. I mean, he's still fighting for it. Um, and But the rumor is, and the understanding is, what he's really wanting is his internationally protected person status back. So that means if he gets the status that me in the United States, we would have to partially fund Harry's security detail in California, which is utterly ridiculous. I refuse to pay for a spoiled brat royal to live in California and use my taxpayer money to watch him go to Trader Joe's or something. And the British taxpayers were like, well, we can't do that. It's too much of a burden. And you have to be so careful about those kind of things as royals. And so Harry came across as incredibly entitled and I think that's continued. And it's just made him look very much worse, especially considering his statements on the First Amendment. You know, he said in the United States, the First Amendment protects our right to free speech, like this platform, um, free religion, free association, that it's bonkers, quote unquote, um, is, shows a lack of depth that's kind of shocking. I mean, if he doesn't like it, he can go to Pyongyang. I'm sure they would be happy to explain to him how a totalitarian dictatorship works and let's see how much he enjoys that. So um, they just came across as incredibly entitled. When it came to Archie's security, they mentioned that as well, but he's seventh in line for the throne, guys. He's constitutionally irrelevant. There's six people ahead of him. And he would have been covered as a child under Harry and Meghan's for the most part, but he would not have had a a specific security detail that I'm sure George, Charlotte, and Louis do. Um, Beatrice and Eugenie had their security pulled. Um, Prince Andrew um, pitched a fit over that and they're like, well, no. And so, you know, that's kind of the way it's going for Archie. And then they also made a big point about his title. Now, originally when the couple announced his birth, they said that he would just remain Archie, Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. And they said, well, he, we wanted him to leave a private life. And I was like, bravo, because that shows an understanding that yes, he will not be a working member of the royal family. And this is why, because of the burden that monarchies put on the system, they are a great representative of the country, but they are also an additional burden. You pay for somebody whose entire life is dressing pretty, going to events, you know, going to charities, those sorts of things, and they're expensive outfits, they have jewelry, they have immense privileges. And so what all families are doing across Europe, it's not just Britain, all families are modernizing and slimming down. Archie would never have been a working royal, regardless of his skin tone, never, because it will just be most likely George, Louis, and Charlotte. All the monarchies are slimming down. This is happening in Sweden. The king stripped his grandchildren from his second and third child, so that's Prince Carl Philip and Princess Madeline, um, stripped their HRHs, so his or her royal highness, and they're just her highness or his highness. And so it's a de kind of demotion in the archetype, and it's been said that they will not be working members of the family. They will get no security. Princess Madeline does, or sorry, not no security, no money in that situation. Princess Madeline, for example, her life is entirely self-funded unless she's doing something specifically for the crown. And then they do cover some of her costs. Um, she lives in Florida. Yes, you've never heard her. There's actually a princess in Florida. She's gorgeous. She's friends with Elon Nordegren, um, <laughs> Tiger Woods' former wife. And so she lives a very luxe life in uh, Miami and you never hear about her, which is awesome. And um, they're doing this in Denmark. So the queen's second born son, Joaquin, and his wife Marie have basically been shuttled off to France. They're no longer working members. They were, but they are not. Um, Prince, Prince Frederick and Crown Princess, sorry, Crown Prince 
Frederick, Crown Princess Mary, and their firstborn son, Prince Christian, will be the only ones ever receiving taxpayer money. So their three other children are basically have already been told, well, you're on your own. Mom and dad can help you from time to time, but you will not be a working member of the family. You will not be getting taxpayer money. I mean, they can still do charity events, but they won't be getting any money. Um, Norway is the same way. Firstborn child of the crown prince and princess. She's a, her royal highness. Her brother is his highness. So again, all the more royal families are streamlining. They're just getting rid of kind of peripheral members and they're just going with the main line of succession. So in the UK, this would be the queen, Charles, and Prince William. Now, right now, Princess Anne is still working. Prince Edward and his wife are still working, but that's the core group. And eventually it'll be Prince George, They'll still probably need Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis, but of course them, like so many others, they'll just keep going down the line of succession. And this is what will happen to Archie right now. He starts as seventh. He will eventually probably become 20th or something. That's just how monarchies work. Considering our world right now, it just comes across as very <laughs> aggravating to people, especially as Harry continues his pursuit of getting his security back in the UK. Now, don't be misconstrued. He has, he can bring over security, but it's going to cost him a pretty penny. If he can get that internationally protected person status back that he used to have with the cow, you know, used to have a, you know, series of cars going with him, police sirens and all these sorts of things, that's pretty much gone away. He's basically in a car like anybody else. And so he wants that status back, but it'll cost the taxpayers and people don't want to incur that cost. He said he'll pay it, but at the end, but he kind of said, and this goes into my final point, that he said he was going to pay it to the public. But then it came out that he didn't really tell the Home Office that until his trial started. So let's move on to our last point. So just finally, what we've learned from Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah, and this is extended throughout this last year, is that Harry and Meghan have a very, very loose association with the truth. And so we even saw this in the start of the interview where Oprah, where either Oprah or Megan said, well, um, you're telling your truth. And this has become kind of a popular thing where it's like, well, this is my truth. This is my experience. There is something called the objective truth. And Harry and Megan have a very loose association with what that actually is. So here's the biggest example right here is their statements about the Archbishop of Canterbury marrying them a couple of days before their wedding. So just go ahead and watch here. Our wedding, you know, three days before our wedding, we got married. Ah. No one knows that, but we called the Archbishop and we just said, look, this thing, this spectacle is for the world but we want our union between us. So like the vows that we have framed in our room are just the two of us in our backyard with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And, oh. and that was the piece that- Just the three of us. Just the, just really, the three of us. Just the three of us. Now what you'll see, and maybe you'll want to rewind and look at this again, is that in this moment where Megan's talking about this gorgeous moment where her and Harry had this kind of marriage in their backyard with the Archbishop, Harry's looking down for the vast majority of this conversation playing with the chicken. I think he knows that she's not telling the entire truth. And the Archbishop of Canterbury came out and said, no, that's not the truth. That they were married on their wedding day, not three days before. They just seem to lie about things they don't need to, to lie about. And Megan has very much a track record of this, um, over inflating things. Um, probably the greatest example is as a child, she, wrote this letter complaining about this dish soap commercial. And she claims that her sole letter, letter from 11 year old girl, caused a, a multi-million dollar company to change their ad, which is utterly ridiculous. Why would a commercial change at the suggestion of an anonymous 11 year old girl? You know, I'm sorry, but nobody cares. <laughs> that's not to be mean, that's just to say, multi-million dollar companies change something because they feel the need to from outside sources. Well, maybe hers was a letter of an avalanche of letters complaining about the commercial. Maybe the head of the company, his wife goes, no, please change that commercial. I hate it. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, or maybe they got subject or, um, what should I call it? They, they do show these type of commercials to certain groups of people to get their reaction. And maybe they started getting a really negative reaction and started to change it. There's a multitude of reasons why they could have changed it. The idea that they would do that to appease the feelings of an 11 year old girl makes no sense. 
And we saw this in the Oprah Winfrey interview when Meghan started talking about her relationship with Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge, and that Kate made her cry in the days leading up to their wedding. Now, I've read a variety of different stories about what actually happened in regards to the bridesmaids. I've heard it's as innocuous as, well, Catherine wanted the girls to wear tights in part because it is royal dress code. And Catherine is very, very aware of what royal procedure is. And she also wanted to do that because she didn't want the little girls getting blisters on their toes from wearing shoes without the proper socks or tights. And you did actually notice at the wedding, Char Charlotte lifting up her, her foot and messing with the back of her shoe as if she was developing a blister. And as a mom of three children at the time, Catherine would know what works best for her children. In addition, Catherine was also like, what, three weeks postpartum, maybe four? Um, I think it was three weeks. She had literally just had her third child. She was very emotional. And so Megan, you know, said that, well, it was Catherine and that she apologized, but she, I'm not going to go into it because, you know, it's, it's bygones. Well, it's like, well, then why bring it up? And A, if that was the wrong story, it would have been come out at some point. There's never been any diverting narrative except for Megan's. It's always been that it was a somehow a fight over the bridesmaids. Again, it could be shoes. It could be, you know, the fitting. I've heard that Charlotte was very fidgety in the fitting. I've also heard, and again, this is just an allegation. I have no clue if that is true, but Charlotte either had a growth spur or maybe, you know, she had gained a little, I mean, she's a little girl. So like that somehow her dress didn't fit and Megan allegedly supposedly called her fat over it. That's, that's been the charge. No clue if it's true. I think I just read it on Tumblr somewhere. So there's been a variety of stories about this, but it's always over Charlotte and these bridesmaids fittings. And while Megan could have cried over it, we didn't even really see her cry in their interview. She would dab her eyes from time to time, but she didn't really cry. You never saw a tear escape her eye. And so it just doesn't make any sense that somehow Catherine is kind of the enemy in this and that the, that everybody was lying except for Megan. And that just doesn't make any sense. And so most likely the rumor is true that Megan somehow made Catherine cry. And maybe Megan did cry, but it was like she cried to Harry or something. And that's how it went down. Um, and so it's just hard to know. But I think their loose association with the truth has just continued. And we saw this most specifically in the court case. In the court case that Harry, that Megan filed against the mail, it came out that, well, she said in the beginning, well, I don't have any of those emails. They were deleted after 30 days or the text messages or whatever. And then her former assistant provided all the information that she said had been deleted. And she said, well, I forgot. It's like, did you really though? Because it helped your case for you not to produce them rather than for you to hide them. And so it's like, it, it kind of revealed you as a liar because it's like, well, how could you forget? And so it's just kind of, or that she couldn't find them or something. It was just kind of a ridiculous, and the court, you know, wanting to not totally offend the monarchy said, well, we'll, we'll take what you suggested, but to the rest of the public, came out again that they just don't really have a great track record with the truth. It just kind of, just a lot of questions. And she says that she was impoverished as a child, but you know, every indication says, I mean, she went to private schools her whole life. And so this notion that Megan somehow was this poor girl who only went to Sizzlers and oh my gosh, okay, this is, this is my pet peeve. She complained about the old spaghetti factory. Now, if you've never been to the United States, you don't know what old spaghetti factory is. It's not my favorite place. I've been there. They're more on the West coast than the East coast. Um, I went there for my fifth grade graduation cause it used to get glasses and they had like Italian sodas or something. I forget. Anyways. So the old spaghetti factory though, is not cheap. <laughs> She's like, Oh, it's so cheap. Like the old spaghetti factory. My, my parents did well, that was a treat to go to the old spaghetti factory. That was, that was kind of a big deal. And so this notion that she's complaining about the old spaghetti factory, like equating sizzlers and the old spaghetti factory in the same, like they're not the same thing in the slightest. Sizzlers is a buffet. I would say I've maybe been to sizzlers a time or two. They're mostly on the West coast. Uh, they're, they're like, you know, they're a buffet. Generally in the United States, buffets are considered pretty low tier, but 
How is Old Spaghetti Factory and Sizzler is the same thing? In the interview as well, Harry and Meghan also were not clear as to who made the supposed comment about Archie's skin tone. Obviously, they, they said they wanted to protect the person, but the broad allegation probably did more damage than it helped, um, which may have been the intention, I'm not sure. However, kind of the biggest thing was that they had two different versions of the story. Megan first said that this was a conversation that happened multiple times while she was pregnant with Archie. However, when Harry joined her later in the conversation, he had an entirely different story about this. He said it was actually just one conversation when they either initially got together or around the time of their engagement. So it was only one time. Megan said it was multiple times. So you gotta wonder, if this situation really happened, why are the two people reporting on it not on the same page within the span of like two hours about what actually occurred. So again, this calls into question, why are they doing this? What are their motivations? Because really at the end of the day, they're smearing the entire royal family based on this, this notion of somebody making a comment about Archie broad sweeping the entire family, which is very, very unfair, being very vague about it, all these sorts of things. But how much truth is there in it if the two people who are reporting it don't even have their stories straight? Last thing before we close out this video, because I know it's gone way, way, way too long. I may need to refilm it and cut things. But when it comes to her allegations of that she was having mental health issues, again, some of this is, is kind of weird. Um, she mentions going to the HR office at Buckingham Palace. Well, she's not a like, they can't help her. And so did that happen? I would guess probably not because like there's nothing, I mean, she would have to know there's nothing they can do about it. And I think she mentioned something about them being unionized or something like that. Like anyways, it just doesn't make any sense. And if she was really having issues, the palace has doctors on retainer. They could have, you know, very, in a small way, very much led her to a, um, an internal doctor who could have helped her. They wouldn't have sent her away somewhere, but they could have actually, they would have absolutely gotten her the help they needed if they knew. But kind of Harry implied that he, he didn't really tell anyone. And then they went to this event at the Royal Albert Hall and she wore these shoes. These are Stuart Weitzman nude, nudist heels. Um, you can see they're very, they're very tall. Um, I've walked in these shoes, <laughs> never worn them anywhere. You can see like the, the bottom. I've had these for like a long time. They were the wrong size. I just kept them cause I couldn't get rid of them for a decent price. But guys, these are a bear to walk in. I can't imagine having mental health stresses and walking in these shoes while like seven months pregnant. I just call foul on that. <laughs> Again, because it fits with this narrative that she's going, that she's somehow the next Diana. And that's what this whole Oprah Winfrey interview was about. Meghan Markle, the next Diana. But she forgot several things along the way. Number one, she's not as young as Diana was when she married into the royal family. Diana was a naive 19 year old girl. Megan was a grown 37 year old professional woman with an acting career experience with the media, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, she's never had the pressure of being a royal, but she's, a very experienced person in terms of the media and doing, you know, variety of things. You can't tell me she's the same as in Diana in any stretch of the imagination. And then she kind of went on the same trajectory in terms of Diana, in terms of when her mental health crisis happened. And so again, this whole interview just screams as a desperate need for both attention and delivering this false narrative that hasn't, that hasn't held up as time has gone on. And so looking back a year later, I think Harry and Meghan, this was probably one of their biggest mistakes post Mexit. Because anytime something comes up, you can go back and look at that interview going, well, that doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. What if it comes out at some point and we know the truth about the bridesmaids in this incident? And it was really Meghan who was the perpetrator and she's on record going, well, it was Kate. Nobody protected me. It's just a very, very bad move. And it came across as inauthentic, um, entitled, and rather arrogant and that they have their truth and nobody else is going to dissuade them otherwise. So anyways, I hope you guys like this video. I look forward to seeing you again really, really soon. Um, give me a like and a subscribe as well. I would love to have you back and we will be doing something on um, fashion on Friday. I think Fridays is going to be Friday fashion day and I'll have a couple of videos upcoming as well. So thank you so much for watching. Bye.